Hello, this is Taras Viktorovich Pluskin at the University of Florida. For this three-part series of talks, we'll be going over a couple different species of detritivore worms. It is my belief that detritivores at large are the unsung heroes, not only of uh, the stability of natural ecosystems, but will potentially be extremely valuable in expanding and intensifying future aquaculture production systems, as they are one of the very, uh, they offer many important uh, avenues for being able to convert toxic substances and waste products back into usable biomasses. So for that reason, I really want them to be highlighted. And worms are one of these major classes of established chitivores that we know about in the aquatic environment. So the first species we'll be going over is tube effects, tube effects, also known as the red worm or the sludge worm. So why tube effects, tube effects? Um, well, it's a oligochaete annelid, so it's a, it's a relative of your backyard earthworm. Uh, it lives in the sediments um, of streams, rivers, uh, sewer lines. Um, it's very well adapted and uh, multiplicited. It's found in these environments throughout the world. Basically, all it needs is a nutrient-rich environment filled with bacteria and other things and uh, a little bit of flow as it is uh, fairly uh, oxygen intensive with its metabolism even though it is able to withstand and uh, survive low oxygen uh, situations. Um, so for years it's been established as a bioindicator species uh, used in a laboratory for a variety of uh, physiological tests as well as uh, uh, indicator tests on the health of ecosystems um, testing for the amount of trace metals and the like that are found in the tissues of contaminated streams containing these critters. Um, it's been a pest in the aquaculture industry, especially for salmonids, as it is a vector for the uh, whirling disease parasite, which uh, kills uh, co uh, nearly um, collapsed uh, several salmon and trout industries. Um, and it is also well known as a feed species, uh, mainly for ornamental aquaculture, but in other parts of the world, mainly in, in the developing world, it has been uh, used to produce several species of uh, food fish as well. Um, so there's a lot of potential to expand the use of the species because it can utilize several things that are found in wastewater, both of agricultural and aquacultural wastewater because uh, of their high nutrients, and even in uh, industrial wastewater. So uh, it has the ability to really reduce um, calcium levels and, and water hardness as well. Uh, so for that reason, the species uh, really does warrant um, further exploration. So the life cycle of these guys is similar to other annelids uh, as far as it being simple yet somewhat um, complex in its own way. Um, so they are all, all hermaphrodites. Uh, they all possess a sperm and egg. Um, the synchrony of the fertilization of these uh, gonads is quite different, so they seldom self-fertilize and are encouraged to cross-fertilize to encourage genetic diversity. Um, mating produces cocoons, which are egg sacs, uh, which will then hatch and form into a juvenile version of the adult. So there isn't any planktonic larval state uh, or the like with these guys. Um, however, they are, can also be produced by uh, fractionation to a point where you know, if two non-vital parts of the worm are severed, they can form into uh, two separate worms. Tube effects, tube effects has been used as a bioindicator species for decades, mainly because this organism thrives in sewer runoff areas, also in the areas of industrial runoff and thus uh, analyzing its tissues has been an effective mechanism for uh, roughly understanding the contamination risks um, that these runoff sites have to the environment. Um, there are many studies that pertain to effects to effects, but I consider these relatively interesting. Um, one was that it, it was able to bioaccumulate cadmium long-term, but other heavy metals um, were passed through uh, the gut uh, before too long. Uh, making these guys not great candidates for being able to trap the heavy metals, but perhaps uh, better candidates for being able to have more, utilable, more utilizable biomass afterwards because they don't 
utilize anything. Uh, of course, you still have the issue of the cadmium. Um, and then a, a more recent study reflects how uh, they do retain microplastics for a good amount of time. And this is uh, a new consideration, of course, but one that should be uh, very much considered when it comes to waste and biomass reutilization. There's also uh, the, of course, unpleasant association of tube effects, tube effects with whirling disease, uh, the pathogen which uh, wiped out much of the West Coast uh, salmon and trout fisheries. Uh, this parasite uses uh, tube effects as part of its, as part of its indirect life cycle, um, and thus uh, much knowledge around tube effects, tube effects has been around eradicating it uh, from uh, farms and the like um, in efforts to control uh, this parasite and this outbreak. However, in a contrary light, tube effects worms have found uh, open arms in the aquarium and ornamental aquaculture industries, where they've been found to be a convenient, uh, reliable uh, live feed for both adults and, um, in some cases, juvenile fish. So the nice things about having live tube effects is that they're visually and olfactory very attractive to most fish. Um, and whereas the, the very lay aquarium keeper will strictly keep to flaked and pelleted foods, um, anyone trying to breed fish will know that there is an enormous benefit to feeding uh, live organisms. Um, simply because you get a better uh, feeding response from finicky or wild fish, um, and that you or you can really excite and, and get uh, broodstock fish to gut load themselves and uh, and, and spawn uh, quicker um, and produce more eggs. Um, so they are very attractive. They literally look like uh, a miniature version of the classic earthworm one would use to go catch a large mouth bass. And perhaps they also have probiotic effects because you are feeding a live organism and not all that bacteria is bad. And a lot of it could perhaps be very good um, for the fish to recruit as opposed to receiving a fully sterilized uh, diet that comes completely from a, a can or a jar. Um, however, there is the potential that it can can potentially vector pathogens. Um, of course, we know of the, the, the of whirling diseases, um, but there are, of course, um, the unknown array of other bacteria and the like that could be introduced to the tank via the tube effects worms. So we'll discuss later how purging and detoxifying the worm biomass is a crucial part of um, any efforts to truly legitimize and expand um, the industrial cultivation of the species. Um, but one nice thing that's, that's been recognized and that's very attractive is that tube effect worms offer an ability to recycle fish waste um, in an area. They, lo they love fish waste and they love the bacteria that grows in fish waste and they are a way to recycle that fish waste and return it back into uh, feed biomass that can be fed directly back into the fish. Um, one of the studies listed here was about a recirculation system which raised giant garami and use the waste to uh, produce live tube effects, tube effects, which could then be fed uh, back to the fry um, and juveniles. Um, so there is a, a question here that I, I would, I guess, halfway answer myself here, a potential fish meal alternative. Um, and no, because of course, the, the worms themselves cannot generate polyunsaturated fatty acids uh, de novo. However, they certainly could slow the, the hemorrhage consumption of those polyunsaturated, acid, polyunsaturated fatty acids um, from the food sources that they are. So once they're fed once in the fish, for instance, instead of going down the drain as in the form of nitrogenous waste, they can be fed uh, perhaps you know 65% and then 25% back in efficiency in the form of, of, of worm protein, perhaps, um, depending on the efficiency of the, the bacteria and the worms. Um, and, and we can see here that utilizing tube effects, tube effects biomass as a feed source is far from a, a, a new trend. We have several leading feed companies here, Omega-1, uh, Hikari, um, and uh, San Francisco Brine Shrimp, that have a vi wide variety of, of dried, freeze-dried, uh, and frozen 
to effects uh, feed items available. So there is an established industry that is largely outside of the scientific community um, and largely kept to either anecdotal or uh, proprietary uh, knowledge. So the diet and digestive mechanisms of two effects, two effects are really what needs to be explored with more intensity uh, to really increase uh, the utilization of this species. Um, we know that two effects, two effects predates on bacteria and protein debris in the sludge um, that it is in. So the, the sludge and the sediment composition is, is highly important. Um, but we also know that they can absorb short chain volatile fatty acids like acetate and propionate from the water, the, from the water itself. Um, however, this mechanism is very much limited by oxygen and, and sodium depletion. Um, but during hypoxic episodes, they have a very multifaceted metabolism. They can shift to an anaerobic metabolism if need be. Um, in which case they will release volatile fatty acids, they will release acetate and propionate into the water column. Um, however, within 60 minutes of the oxygen returning to suitable levels, they can resume reabsorption of the volatile fatty acids that they've, that they've lost and uh, begin to grow again with aerobic metabolism. So there are a lot of secrets. Um, and of course, they have a, a very expansive uh, probiotic community within their guts uh, which holds many potential secrets and, uh, in my opinion, the true uh, holdings of their, of their value as a waste mitigating species. So I really wanted to put a spotlight on this paper by Devok et al. Um, and this is an effort to really understand the microbial community, not only in the worms itself, uh, digestive tract, but to understand the microbial community of the uh, the sludge that the worms chose to prey upon and the sludge that the, 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 the worms had preyed upon. So what was the community that the worms chose to prey upon and what was that microbial community afterwards? And what they found was that this uh, microbial community uh, of the sludge really did resemble the microbial community of the sludge before and after it was preyed upon. It was not more similar to the microbial community of the gut of the of the worm, and they think this is because the proteins that are absorbed by by the worm are then hydrolyzed by the bacteria in the intestinal community, and that the, the microbial community that is inside the, the protein matrix preyed upon by the worm uh, utilizes these hydrolyzed protein products. They utilize kind of the bits and pieces of the reaction that goes down in the worm's gut. Um, so we, we see here kind of an interesting um, hypothesis where there's an almost stabilizing effect where the worm is in some symbiosis uh, not only with the uh, microbiome in its gut but the microbiome within the sludge that it quote unquote preys upon and I thought this, this was a very interesting approach to kind of understand what really was happening with quote unquote these sludge worms um, and to see really uh, how we could cultivate them on a mass scale but also really what is the true value of their bio extraction properties. So we take these, these known physiological mechanisms and capabilities, tube effects, tube effects, and we see kind of its hidden power here, which is its potential as a bioremediation species. So the bottom line here is that tube effects worms can utilize various wastes and byproducts from other industries. From aquaculture, we know that they can take up fish waste and the, pro and the bacteria and the, and the leftover proteins from fish waste and, and fish feed. Um, so we know that there's applications both for, for treating pond wastewater and potentially in recirculation aquaculture as well. Um, because of this principle, we know that there's also applications in domestic wastewater. So as we have a human population that is excreting huge amounts of, of nitrogen and other nutrients into our local water bodies, and this is causing all kinds of issues, including eutrophication, you know, instead let's, let's take that, that waste, that human waste and, uh, Instead of just stripping it and releasing those nutrients, let's let's turn that into worm biomass if we can. Let's have those worms strip away, uh, among one thing perhaps, like the free volatile fatty acids that uh, are wasted and being released in our waste.
um, and return that back into the food source and as pig feed or fish feed or the like. Um, of course, uh, there have been demonstrations with uh, cow manure, pig manure, um, poultry manure, and also the, the waste products from dairy sludge. So for dairy and cheese manufacturing, the, the waste for that has been used to, to produce tube effects to greater avail. Um, and then interestingly enough, there are also many applications for reducing tube effects for industrial uh, hard water. So anything that is very rich in calcium can be brought down by the, the sheer weight of the of the, of the, of the, the metabolic uh, power of the, of the worms and their associated microbial community will bring down the pH and, and reduce calcium levels that otherwise would be toxic to local water bodies. So to summarize, you see the, the series of images below, you see, um, well, frankly, um, what is typical of, of, of the blossomed fruit of our global supply chain and its decadence, which is usually waste and great big piles of shit. And then in the middle, we see uh, mechanisms um, in the coming 21st century, uh, such as bioextracting and bioremediation species, such as two effects, two effects, that can take some of that waste and turn it back into usable biomass. And in the third state, we see the, the manifestation of the value-added product of that recaptured biomass and uh, a little bit of coin on the side, because hopefully, if properly efficient, uh, it should be profitable. And if it's not profitable, then it's 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 waste in its own way now, isn't it? So currently, uh, two effects two effects cultivation is not certainly not uh, unheard of yet. Is still relatively uh, unexpanded and unworked upon as far as uh, scientific industrialization standpoint. Um, so there are several uh, different potential methods for, for cultivating two effects at scale. First is obviously pond cultivation. Um, this is probably the most cult common form of cultivation. Um, it allows you to produce the most uh, tube effects per, uh, well, the most tube effects um, possible at scale. Um, most amount of capital input, um, most amount of environmental control as well. So you really, um, on one side, you really don't have to uh, feed the tube effects in theory because they're eating the natural microconsortium that's growing within your pond. Uh, you can set that up, you know, in a variety of ways you choose, but it also reduces your amount of control or how, uh, what might be in that tube effects when you harvest it. Um, so in order to properly harvest this cheaply produced worm biomass, there might be other costs when it comes to, uh, cleaning and detoxifying the worm biomass. Um, but there's also the greatest, because of the scale uh, that the worms can be cultivated at with pond technology uh, and at the cost, um, there's the greatest potential for industrial synergy um, with larger scale in industries to be able to, to drop their waste off in a, in, a, in a pond or a raceway filled with these worms. So the other method is tank cultivation. So you have a lot more control than ponds, but uh, you know, at a much smaller scale uh, because you are limited by the material of the tanks and the cost and the filling the tanks, and et cetera. Um, and, but you have more environmental controls. You can control what the worms are eating. You can control the relative community that they're exposed to. And you can avoid major sources of identified pests or contaminants. Um, and more importantly, um, these uh, methods can also be most easily deployed in the urban setting. So wherever there is waste, um, there needs to be worms or waste removing agents and species that can be uh, grown easily enough in the urban setting are ideal. Um, and then of course there's recirculation aquaculture, um, which increases the complexity of the system as um, anyone who runs a recirculation aquaculture system knows um, adding one more thing is like uh, potentially uh, pushing over all the, the dominoes, but the potential reward of having these uh, tube effects worms in the system is that A, you know, if you don't have any uh, uh, parasites, uh, theoretically, you have a source of clean worms that you don't have to worry about bringing in any contamination from the outside, and you have a mechanism for being able to turn, uh, being able to reduce your solids without using electrical filtration. Uh, and you can turn those waste solids back into usable biomass and fish feed. So what are the most important culture considerations of tube effects, tube effects? Well, the first is sediment quality. Um, 
obviously you need to modulate the amount of soft oxygen that you have, but it really, what we really need to expand upon is the knowledge of how these worms interact with their uh, prey substrate, quote unquote, um, and how it is that we can best utilize uh, these worms' ability to absorb and work with the substrate um, of their choice. So sediment quality is one of the most important considerations. Um, and along with that is feedstock. So is, are you going to allow it to be natural feedstock, um, natural detritus that, that, that forms um, this uh, microbial matrix that the worms will feast upon? Um, and if so, if not, are you going to, to feed them? And what are you going to feed them? And what quality will it be? And what cost? And how, how does that reflect in the, the growth of the worms um, and, and the overall quality of the biomass that you get before and after uh, depuration. And then the last consideration that's major is the biological risk. You know, how clean is your culture environment and how much detoxifying will you have to do to have an acceptable product? Um, will you be able to have a live product that can be sold for a, uh, you know, a premium price, at least for a worm? Or are you going to have a product that will have to be dried and treated heavily um, to have its biomass be not, not an obvious contaminant to the, the consumer? Um, so these are all very important considerations. Um, one thing that's kind of interesting is I found one paper about uh, these compounds, which were able to um, detoxify um, heavy metals um, and uh, also had growth in antioxidant properties um, and demonstrated laboratory cultures of tube effects, tube effects. So there are mechanisms um, perhaps not only for making uh, these tube effects um, for depurating them, but also for improving uh, the growth at the same time. So here we see some uh, tank-based tube effects, tube effects production in India. Here we see that this is in more of an urban environment, um, which is very interesting. Um, so that we're able to take uh, waste, uh, in this case, I believe this paper referenced uh, pig manure that was taken, uh, processed slightly, and then um, being able to fed as a feedstock to these tube effects, tube effects, which are then being used for uh, food aquaculture fish species. Um, so this is a growing practice in India where there is a growing need to, uh, to recycle and preserve food waste products as much as possible. Here we see another uh, rack culture system. I believe this is in Indonesia. Uh, here we see a larger semi-recirculating system for tube effects culture. So we see the floor here is acting as a large sump, um, and which is uh, taking in water, uh, putting it through rough filtration, and then returning it back to these racks filled with tube effects. Um, so the tube effects are exposed to a steady flow of high nutrient flow water. And you can see here that they've achieved quite a density um, the reason because that they're so red is because they're able to have extremely high concentrations of hemoglobin in their blood um, and thus are able to withstand uh, low uh, hypoxic uh, environments. So what really is the future prospects of tube effects, tube effects aquaculture? Um, frankly, I do think that there is uh, a future in this species. There is far more value in detritivore species than is currently utilized. Uh, and this is because they are a mechanism to convert bioindustrial waste into usable biomass. You can return, you can get an increased return on your investment while reducing your ecological impact by using intermediate species which recycle and recapture uh, the waste products of, of valuable raw materials. Um, and then if managed properly, there can be a value-added feature, feature to this detritivore biomass um, that can really increase um, the pro uh, potential profits and redu mainly reduce the costs of recirculation aquaculture systems and potentially provide an alternative um, to fish meal, at least being um, in, in, in its freshwater applications um, in particular. Um, so where there needs to be essential future investments as far as expanding tube effects aquacultures, especially in the West, is there needs to be uh, increased strain development. 
for growth. These guys need to be looked at not as a pest species or a bioindicator species, but as a, as a cultivatable species that needs to be selectively grown, identified for the strains which have desirable characteristics, identify the, the genes behind those desirable characteristics and do what you can to selectively breed for them, if not uh, directly genetically manipulate them. Um, and those genetic uh, um, you know, desirable characteristics would be high growth rate, um, you know, ability to withstand uh, different environmental conditions and ability to absorb various uh, wastewater products, um, ability to absorb and retain polyunsaturated fatty acids in their tissues, um, et cetera. Um, there also needs to be a lot of investments in purging and depuration technology that will increase the usability and economic uh, profitability of worm biomass. And then there also needs to be investments in mass scale industrial synergy uh, behind the producers of this mass scale waste at the industrial and agricultural level um, and the worm producers, if they are not you know, those producers themselves, how do you deliver that waste to the worm producers economically and efficiently in a way that reduces the cost for the waste producer and increases the productivity for the worm producer. Uh, thank you for your time for listening to this presentation and I look forward to talking about uh, two other species, um, Umbilicus variegatus, the California black worm, and uh, Neris virens, uh, the ragworm or uh, marine polychaete.